uh, today's webinar. Uh, welcome everyone to today's Title Topics webinar. Uh, these are Alta's free presentations offered every month on issues important to title professionals. I'm Jeremy Yowie, Alta's Vice President of Communications, and today we've got a fantastic webinar planned uh, with uh, some expert speakers that are going to uh, help you understand the opportunities that are available for uh, title companies uh, who are willing to embrace the embrace compliance and, and use it as a competitive advantage. Uh, before starting, I just need to touch on a few housekeeping items. A copy of today's presentation was emailed earlier today to all reg registrants. If you didn't get it, please shoot me an email at jyohe at alta.org. That's j-y-o-h-e at alta.org. And I will uh, email you a copy after uh, the conclusion of today's presentation. All participant lines are muted for today's presentation. If at any time you have a question, uh, please use the chat box function. Uh, we'll hold some time at the end for, uh, for questions. Uh, we had more than 700 people register for today's webinar, so there's definitely interest in, in how to effectively market your business in this compliance age. Uh, as an added benefit, today's presentation is being recorded. After this process, the recording will be available on Alta's website, and that's at alta.org forward slash title topics. And again, that's alta.org forward slash title topics. I need to thank Fidelity for sponsoring our title topics webinars this year. Uh, their support allows us to continue providing these educational opportunities free of charge. Uh, with that out, out of the way, let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Phil Fanning of Fidelity National Title Group. Phil is Fidelity's New England Area Manager and Counsel. Uh, next, we have Gregory McDonald. Greg is the founder of CloudStar. Uh, CloudStar offers compliant cloud-based cloud technology solutions. Also joining us is Christopher Scraba. Chris is founder of the advertising and marketing firm Ralston and & Anthony. And rounding out today's speakers is Jim Paulino. Jim is founder of Lodestar Software Solutions, which offers information and technology services. Guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, with those introductions uh, done, I'll, I'll turn the conversation over to you, Phil. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, first and foremost, on behalf of the panelists, I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the American Land Title Association as an indispensable partner and helping the industry navigate the CFPB challenges ahead and for being the premier source of education in this area. Uh, ALCA supports the conveyancing industry, as you know, and we, in turn, uh, should support them, and we're happy to do so. Uh, today, we're going to have a conversation about marketing and communication on the, under the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau. Uh, what is the CFPB? Uh, who are they? and uh, what can we uh, uh, gain insight uh, uh, from with this organization. Um, most of you on the call probably know all about this. We're going to, going to uh, kind of dip into the old news a little bit just to get some history. And, and the reason that we want to do that is simply because we want people to uh, really understand that the goal of these regulatory agencies uh, is consumer protection. Uh, why do we make a big point about that? It's because you know, whether or not our customer is directly or indirectly the consumer, it's, it's very important that we come back to that fundamental concept of consumer protection because it's so important uh, to our ability to make a transition uh, from compliance as an obligation to compliance as a marketing opportunity. There's not a, a lot of analogies in this regard, but uh, one that does come to mind, not the best analogy, but you can think of the auto industry of decades ago. Uh, regulation brought safety enhancements to the production of automobiles. Uh, making those enhance, enhancements was cumbersome and costly, and the automakers really didn't like it. But the purpose of those regulations was also consumer protection, specifically consumer safety. Uh, some automakers embraced the challenges brought by those new regulations and actually went beyond those challenges to market the safety features in their new products. They stayed in the game, and in fact, they stayed ahead of the game. 
and that's sort of the point of this conversation today, is to help you to stay in the game and to stay ahead of the game. Uh, to have perspective with the CFPB challenges, uh, think of the purpose, consumer protection, and then think of the opportunities that can bring to you. I'd like to uh, just briefly summarize the major challenges we are facing in response to the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, ALPS's best practices, and the TRID rule, all of which you'll hear about today. Uh, let's start historically with Dodd-Frank. Uh, Chris Dodd, Senator from Connecticut, Barney Frank, Congressman from Massachusetts. In uh, 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act was enacted. It didn't become effective until 2011. Its purpose was to really address the egregious practices on the part of mortgage lenders of the day. Uh, again, consumer protection. The full name of the act was the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. It called for the creation of a consumer protection watchdog group, and that watchdog group is now known as the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Bureau's goal was to focus on consumer rights, consumer protection, the right of the consumer to privacy, uh, data access rights, usage, disclosures, and information security. Um, tall task, and they, uh, they basically are a very large organization run by Director Richard Cadre. Um, the annual budget is over $450 million. They have over 1,400 employees. Um, they do have limited accountability. Um, they, uh, in essence, have consolidated through the CFPB uh, the consolidation and oversight of a number of uh, of regs that you're probably very familiar with, including Reg X, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, and Reg Z, Truth in Lending. Uh, they also include uh, consumer leasing, home mortgage disclosures, equal credit opportunity. It's, it's a broad base of what their oversight uh, in, in includes. They have rulemaking authority for all the financial institutions offering consumer financial services. Uh, such as mortgages, student loans, prepaid debit cars, car loans, consumer leases, and credit reporting. Um, they are now turning uh, more immediate attention to elder abuse in debt collection, discriminatory treatment with car loans, and the like. The Bureau is one of the few uh, bureaus in, in, in the United States run by a director rather than a commission or a committee. The director is appointed by the president. Uh, subject to the advice and consent of Congress. The, the director is able to hire his or her own staff and delegate powers to it. Uh, the actions of the director can only be vetoed by a supermajority of Congress. Uh, we don't really have a good definition of supermajority, but um, um, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than 50 percent. Uh, with the new Congress, there is some movement to change the way the CFPB is governed. There's currently five new bills pending in Congress to try to curtail some of CFPB's spending, among other things. Um, one of the bills is seeking to have CFPB run by a five-member commission rather than one director. Uh, that bill actually suggests renaming the CFPB to the Financial Product Safety Commission Act of 2015. Um, the members and the chairperson would be appointed by the president, but it would be subject to Senate approval. It would be a five-year staggered term with no three members coming from the same uh, political party. There are a number of financial groups that are supporting these bills thus far, uh, including the American Banking Association, the American Financial Services Association, Consumer Banking Association, Credit Union National Association, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, in an effort to assist professionals with CFPB compliance, ALTA has developed what's known as the, uh, its best practices. Um, I'm not going into that at this point, but that's uh, one of the uh, things you're going to be hearing about uh, time and time again and one of the challenges that you're going to face. 
The focus of this seminar is really to discuss how agents can uh, comply with the new regulations, uh, including the oversight provisions, the ALTA best practices, and what's known as the TRID rule. If you're not familiar with the acronym TRID, T-R-I-D, it stands for Truth in Lending plus RESPA plus Integrated Disclosures. Um, not the uh, best acronym, but it's what we have. Um, one concern that the title industry uh, faces is uh, the, with the uh, thought by some of the smaller agents that they are too small to comply with the cost of regulations. And so the questions uh, keep coming up. Will the smaller agent undertake the expense? Or will they merge? Or will they partner with other agents? Um, will they be attractive to smaller lenders and smaller credit unions? There are a number of, um, of, the, of the best practices pillars that, that aren't that egregious to comply with, and they're, they're not that expensive. And some of it actually you know, simply makes sense. And um, so there, there is going to be a, a point in time when the, the smaller agent is going to have to um, you know, decide uh, whether or not an investment in compliance is, is appropriate for their particular business model. Um, we think there are certainly ways that uh, that, that can be accomplished, and uh, I think that, um, that in fact, uh, once you make that transition from compliance being an obligation to compliance being an opportunity, um, you, you can open the door to creative ways to comply and to remain uh, in the game and, in fact, ahead of the game. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, so if there's only one, um, if there's only one fact or one one takeaway that you have from the seminar, um, what we would like it to be is that these changes are happening, um, and there's no stopping them at this point. And I know you may just be shaking your head now or being like, yes, that's obvious. Um, however, Phil, Chris, Greg, and I travel the country talking about these topics, and I'm still amazed by the number of agents that either think things are going to be pushed back or they don't apply to them. Um, or it's just not something that's going to change. I know that there's been times in the industry where things change. Um, for example, 2010, the HUD disclosed the HUD was changing. Um, that got pushed back several months. Um, it's unlikely that any sort of pushback is going to happen with these disclosures, um, as well as best practices. This is something that the industry has had close to two years warning on. Um, so if you're not having any conversations to prepare for this, um, I strongly recommend that you start those now. I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here because the type of people who are proactive enough to log on to this webinar are probably prepared for that, but it's just something I like to say um, when we have um, these types of uh, seminars. Um, so what we don't want you to do is view um, compliance as, a, as, an, op as an obligation. Um, compliance should be an opportunity for you to become more efficient as a business um, and for you to market all of the great things that you're doing um, to um, comply to these rules and ultimately help the consumer. Um, so what we're going to cover today um, is kind of smart compliance management, ways for you to go about um, make use of the resources both through Alta as well as a lot of the great vendors out there and a lot of great technology solutions that really allow title agents of any size to comply to these regulations in a cost-efficient way. Um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about the integrated mortgage disclosures and the fact that um, the, the visibility of price is going to be very, very transparent uh, to the consumer, and ultimately that's going to um, change the ways that a title agent needs to communicate and deal with the consumers. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, Chris and Greg, who are going to be talking about uh, smart compliance management. Thank you very much. This is Greg McDonald. So um, really what we want to talk about is leveraging technology as a tool to spread the word 
And by spreading the word, what we mean is if you're going through the best practices, you're embracing change, you're making the proper changes to your workflow and to your data security models, you want to share this information, right? If you're doing something well, if you're building a great company, don't you want to share that, right? So what can we do as title agents to let the world know? And, and why do we want to let the world know? Well, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, uh, is probably your website. So, for example, you're working with a new realtor. You're working with a new lender. Maybe you're working directly with, with a buyer or a seller. Um, what's the first thing that you do these days? Well, probably go to Google, right? You're going to Google the parties that are involved in your transaction, especially if you're you know, an average consumer. Maybe you're not really 100% sure what title insurance is. Right? So you're going to go online, you're, you're going to Google the lender, you're going to Google the realtor, just, just do your, your, your due diligence. And obviously people are going to want to know more about the title company. So what does your website look like? Right? We want to make sure that we're using technology to our advantage, but most importantly, communicating what we're doing in compliance to the general public. So we look like attractive companies for lenders to do business with. So. You know, what I would recommend is somewhere on your website, if you haven't done it already, talk with your web developer. Put something on there about data security. What are you doing as a title company to protect consumer data? It's a big topic these days, identity theft. It's addressed quite heavily in the Alta Best Practice Pillar 3. So talk about it. Tell the world that you're embracing these best practices and, and, and communicate to those that are considering doing business with your company that you take this seriously. If you're using email encryption, put that in there. Put it on your website. Tell the world that you're doing these things. Maybe you're running background checks. That's a good thing, right? So, so why not spread the word? Why not use the technologies that are available to us? And, and Chris, in a few moments, will talk about some of these, uh, perhaps through you know social media, to tell the world what it is that you're doing. Chris? Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. My name is Christopher Scraba. Um, so let's talk about ways that you can spread the word. Let's talk through a sample strategy that you can implement now uh, to tell the world about being compliant. At the end of the day, we really need to look at who the CFPB is and what they do. And perhaps the most important element of that acronym is the very first letter, consumer. At the end of the day, the consumer the CFPB focuses on uh, securing the interests of the consumer. Uh, we're all aware of the fact that the consumer is going to be more inclined and empowered to choose their own title agency. Uh, so implementing some consumer-focused, consumer-centric uh, marketing strategies will not only assist to develop your brand online, but also instill trust in the consumer. I have dialogues with clients every day and prospective clients every day about the challenges of becoming compliant. And what I tell everyone is take a look at the real world. Take a look at the world we live in today. As Greg mentioned, uh, the adoption of technology is, is, is moving at a very fast pace. And with that comes the opportunity for a great amount of risk, which compliance works to try and uh, keep safe. Um, being compliant is not necessarily um, a burden, more so than a tool to build trust between your brand and the consumers that you ultimately hope to work with, or the consumer that your lender or perhaps that realtor is working with. As Greg said, spreading the message is key. Um, I really like the car analogy that Phil brought up uh, from the 1970s and the 1980s with the safety. What's the very first thing that companies like Volvo and Mercedes-Benz did? It's, it, they brought to, to light the safety innovations, and furthermore, they went above and beyond. Being social is very important. In a recent study, it was found that 77% of title agencies broadcast their message socially. Now, is social media necessarily going to drive new business to your, to your title agency? 
Probably not, just based on the nature of how we get business as title agents. However, it's an excellent tool for reputation management. It's an opportunity for your brand to broadcast its message in real time, live on the internet. Why not create material, as Greg had mentioned on your website, about how you just implemented encrypted email, or perhaps your consumer dispute resolution management software, and how about creating articles on why those are beneficial for your consumers and why that gives you a competitive advantage on a blog on your website and broadcast that message socially. What is the first thing that we do when we're looking for companies to partner with? We do go to Google. We do search. And we'd like to research the people that we're getting ready to do business with. And social media tends to always be on that first page of the results for your company. That's a good opportunity for you as a title agency and as a business owner because that's an opportunity to control the message that your consumer is ultimately going to be uh, researching and hearing from your company. Deliver the message directly to their desk. Now, again, I said social media probably won't develop the business, but where are we as busy people all day long? We're constantly connected to our email. It's on our phone. It's on our tablet. It's up on our desktop. Email marketing is a great way to broadcast that message and to bypass the secretary, if you will, and really deliver that message right to the desk of the person that you are looking to communicate with. And again, another opportunity to share those resources that you create in regards to why being compliant is beneficial to the customers that you work with. Again, a lot of those materials uh, being on your website, but what happens once you actually get that lead? You know, you broadcast on social media daily, you send out twice weekly emails, you start to get the leads, you're talking to them. The next step and the next point of contact that they're going to have in your title company is going to be your sales professional. And it's important to educate your sales professionals in regards to the bits of compliance and what specifically your title agency has done and make sure that they're passionate about the changes that have happened. Around 90% of sales are based on likability alone. So having a friendly, passionate salesperson that seems dedicated to your customer's privacy and to their protection uh, and to their satisfaction is going to be key in selling the best practices as something that will ultimately build trust between you and the end consumer. Again, be that someone who's actually buying the house or the lender loaning the money. Be a thought leader and set the trends in your industry. Uh, we've noticed a growing trend of title agencies hosting continuing education uh, seminars, be that on the web or even in person. Uh, I work with a lot of title companies that are using meeting space in their offices to educate realtors and to educate lenders, uh, both in areas of compliance as well as areas that affect them in their industry specifically. And it's all in your plan. Remember to craft a well-rounded plan that really uh, sets you as a thought leader in your industry and as a trendsetter. It's important to keep in mind compliance is not a burden. It's to protect the consumer. We don't want title agencies making headlines like Target that, that social security numbers or addresses were, were leaked and hacked. And we all think it's never going to happen to us. Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing only happens to Target. But the fact of the matter is it can happen to all of us. And in a hacker's mind, some of these smaller companies or, or even some larger title agencies that might not be quite target size might be easier to infiltrate just simply because of the nature of their size and the money that, that they assume is being invested into these bits of information, these components of business. So we're all targets. And uh, making sure that we're communicating with our clients that we're actively taking steps to not cause our customers to become victims of the growing trends, that, that, uh, the growing consequences of adopting technology is really important in building trust in 2015. So remember, as you craft your message, craft your message with the ideals of trust and integrity. 
make sure that your staff is passionate and actively sharing resources, and that will go a long way to establishing your title agency as a leader in your market. I'm going to push everything back to Jim now. Jim? Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, one other thing I just wanted to touch on based off what Chris was saying. Um, while not everyone at your company may be doing sales calls and actually going out to meetings, um, everyone at the company is a salesperson one way or another, and you want to make sure that not only your dedicated marketing and sales staff know how to have these conversations, but everyone in the company needs to be prepared to talk about best practices, um, the changes to integrated disclosures, really anything that's going to come up from one of your clients or a consumer, um, everyone at the company needs to, needs to know this. Um, so we're going to take a minute and talk about the integrated mortgage disclosures um, and the types of changes that they're having, mainly on the way you're working with uh, the lenders. Um, so before we dive into these three different solutions, I want to talk about it more broadly um, for a minute here. Um, so this is one of the largest changes coming to the industry in probably the last 20 years. Um, and what's happening is the forms that are typically provided by the closing agents, the HUD, is being replaced with a closing disclosure that's going to be um, most likely provided by the lender. Um, so there's been many announcements um, from Bank of America, Wells Fargo, I'm sure you've all seen it, that they want responsibility for the final delivery of these forms. Um, and the issue that that creates for title agents is really a, a lack of control in some ways, that you want to make sure that all of the fees that you want to make sure are charged, the owner's policy, the other things that you work, um, that the consumer needs really to protect themselves um, are all properly in these forms. So you really have to be a little more proactive about working with your lenders much earlier in the process um, than before to make sure this happens. And there are quite a lot of solutions and ways uh, to do that currently. Um, so the big takeaway um, I want you guys to have here is if you're not talking with your um, title software providers or other software providers about these forms already, start today. Um, I know four months may seem like a, a long time. Um, in the technology world and with the scale of projects that are happening here, it really is not long at all. Um, so it's something that really needs to be started sooner rather than later. Um, not only just talking with your technology companies, but really analyzing any workflows in your organization to see how reliant things are on kind of the way that business has gone for the last 20 years. You may find something like you have a lot of internal references to HUD line numbers um, in your software systems or in your emails or in other things you use. All of those references will be going away. So that's an example of the type of things um, that you should be looking into. Um, the other thing that we're seeing some of the more progressive agents do is start talking with their lenders about how they're going to be collaborating to fill out these forms efficiently and as quickly as possible. So what you can see on this slide here are effectively three different ways um, that you can get your fees to the lender. Um, and you should be doing one of these, basically. Um, so the most simple approach here is to um, Basically, fill out a form when you get a request from a lender, get your fees over, and you're getting the exact same closing disclosure document and sending it to a lender. Um, this is essentially how you collaborate on, um, on documents now on the good faith estimate in the HUD. Um, you have to make sure that when you're passing anything between the lender and yourself, you do it in the most secure way possible. Um, so this kind of manual solution may not be something that you want to do going forward. Um, so if you feel like you're doing this in a very manual way, way now, even faxing documents between yourself and the lender, um, that's something that you really have to analyze and, and stop. Um, the, one of the more common solutions um, that's being marketed right now um, is Closing Insight, which is a shared portal that lenders and title agents are able to use and collaborate on documents. Um, so this is a secure way that any documents and associated fees can be collaborated on um, between the lender and the title agent. Closing Insight is the, the name that you guys have probably seen the most often for this. Um, Wells Fargo Bank of America, Chase Bank have all made announcements that they're using that. However, they're far from the only solution out there. So a lot of other software providers will be introducing these, and there are very similar platforms out there. Um, and finally, what you may see happening um, 
through talking with your software providers as well as lenders is you may go to completely integrate your systems with a lender so everything falls comes through on a more automated basis. Um, so those are the types of things that we're seeing about how title agents are preparing themselves to work on these documents. Um, the last thing that we want to um, do here is spend a little time talking about the fact on the um, new documents, owner's policy is listed as optional. So this is a big deal for title agents um, because owner's policy is um, obviously how a lot of title agents make their revenue. So it's very important um, that this stays on there, not just for the title agents, but for the consumer, because there are a lot of things, um, a lot of reasons why a consumer needs this. Um, so the difference for the title agent here is you're really going to have to be proactive about educating um, and informing your customers what's this owner's policy and why they need it. Um, so I'm going to toss it to Phil here to talk about how he's having some of those conversations now and the type of things that you can tell uh, your clients and your customers um, about why they need an owner's policy. Thank you, Jim. Yes, this is a, a, a very important uh, concern that we have because, as, as you know from your own experience, you don't have a lot of face time with your customers. You don't have a lot of opportunities to explain something that's not the easiest to, uh, to understand. Uh, it starts off, you, you start off a little bit in the hole, so to speak, because it's listed as optional. Uh, the earlier versions of what came out actually said it didn't use the term optional, it used the term not required. And it was only through the great effort to, uh, on the part of Alta that the wording was softened a bit to optional. Um, and, uh, you know, however, optional. Uh, it's still not a great term because uh, something labeled optional, especially to somebody who might be making their largest purchase of their life, um, something labeled optional can be interpreted as unnecessary or of little value. Um, so uh, we, uh, we could get that changed and we have to deal with it. And the, the other aspect of, of this is that Probably half the states in the country offer some type or more offer some type of simultaneous rate discount. Currently, the prototypes for both the loan estimate um, uh, would would include a full loan premium as well as a full owner's premium. Uh, this, of course, inflates the pr the price of, and and is misleading. So, uh, ALTA is still attempting to work uh, uh, with that particular uh, issue. Um, the irony of all this is, as we started this conversation at the beginning of this webinar, we focused on the fact that the, that the purpose of this regulation is consumer protection. How ironic is it that a regulation whose purpose is consumer protection seems to make very little effort to guide the consumer to one of the cheapest, most cost-effective consumer products out there, the owner's title insurance policy. A one-time, relatively small premium, not an annual premium. It's in effect for the entire period of the insured ownership and beyond if the insured conveys out by warranty of title. You know, truly the best bargain in town for protection of the consumer, and it's and it's 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 sort of relegated to the category of optional. Um, unlike other forms of insurance, title insurance is retrospective rather than prospective based on risk avoidance rather than risk assumption. A lot of work goes on prior to the issuance of the title policy to minimize the chance an insured will actually have a claim. Claims are rare, but, but the fact that claims are rare should never be the reason someone decides not to get an owner's policy. They're supposed to be rare. The claims are supposed to be rare due to the amount of due diligence undertaken to issue the policy. Um, and even with that, the amount of claims paid out by the title in industry is, is a significant number. Um, still, the forms do indicate optional. So what do we do about it? Um, it's up to us as title professionals to educate the consumer, uh, the bankers, the lenders, the realtors, of the importance of purchasing an owner's policy. The key to this is educating the consumer early on in the process. For those jurisdictions where uh, the attorney agent jurisdiction, that could be uh, uh, broached in the initial engagement letter. Uh, for everyone else, it could start as early as a conversation with the realtor. 
um, it's going to be a challenge, um, but um, in, in just as you see on your screen from Socrates, the secret of change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the, uh, the designation as optional, but on uh, building from there, which is what we want to do. And what do we have to, to, to uh, address this and to go forward? We have education and communication. Those are really the only tools we have uh, to win that battle. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, basically, uh, just to conclude here, um, I really want to stress that there are resources available um, for all of these changes coming up. There are tools at your disposal, and if it's not something that you've started at your company, um, we really recommend it. You, you're starting to focus on it and starting to prepare. Um, the first place I would recommend looking is the Alta website for both the integrated disclosures as well as best practices. We have a whole lot of free information there that can really help you um, before you go and you, you actually bring in a vendor or bring in someone to uh, certify your company with best practices or anything like that. Um, so really make use of the resources um, that are there. Um, and best of luck to everyone. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to open it up for, for any questions. Um, I think you can type them in to, to Jeremy. Um, yeah, thanks, Jim. I uh, do have one that I'm going to. OK. Yeah, go, go right ahead. Um, I actually have a question uh, for, for Greg that I wanted to start with, um, with regards to best practices and um, some cost-effective ways that smaller title agents can comply with best practices, especially the uh, Pillar 3 for data security that I know uh, is kind of one of the more difficult um, pillars to, to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, first and foremost, anyone that's looking for help with Pillar 3, I would strongly encourage them to go to the alta.org website. Alta has done just a fantastic job of publishing uh, self-help, um, if you will, I hate to put it that way, but uh, kind of self-guided tours of best practice Pillar 3, and they've really done a good job at offering options uh, for agents of all size. Um, but, you know, it's a very valid question, and it's one that we hear quite often as Pillar 3, um, you know, just to, to refresh, which is the protection of non-public information, primarily on the technology side, but also in the physical side of the office, right? That seems to be the one that people struggle with the most. There's a lot to it, and ultimately, um, we we see that the smaller agents are concerned. You know, how how are we going to pay for this? So, um, I think where we start is pillar three does not necessarily mean that you have to spend money. It it really doesn't. So take a look at your office, right? I hate to keep coming back to this, but there's this concept of the clean desk policy. It, it's a visual, right? You you walk into someone's house for the first time. You know, we all like to say that we don't judge. Well, you know, you walk into someone's house for the first time, and you're going to have an opinion. We're, we're people. You know, we're very sensory oriented. We walk into an office for the first time. We open our eyes. What do we see? Do we see chaos and clutter, or do we see a clean desk? Now, most of us are conditioned. We know that we walk into the local branch of a bank, be it Bank of America, be it Wells Fargo. There's some very strict policies in place. You're not going to see other customers' data out on that banker's desk. On the contrary, your desk is going to be clean. They're going to lock their computer if they have to get up from their desk to go print out a statement or what have you. So first and foremost, tip number one, small agent, large agent, medium-sized agent. Start with what you can control today. If money is a problem, you know, I think everyone can respect that. But there's things you can do today to control costs. The first thing is have a talk with your staff. Clean things up. It's a visual. When, when you are assessed, uh, if a lender should stop by, whatever's going to happen, underwriter rep, you want to put on a, first, a good first impression. It's the first thing that you can do. And you know what that costs? It costs nothing. It costs absolutely nothing to keep your office in, in good repair. You know, the second thing is training. Sitting down and talking with your team about common sense data security, 
that's really going to go a long way to stopping some of the bad things that can happen to your company. You talk about it, but then you document it. It doesn't cost you any money to document what you've done. You have training in place, you have procedures in place, and there's plenty of templates available for, for different procedures around data security. Many of the underwriters are offering them free of charge to their agents. So get a hold of these. Talk to your underwriter. Talk to your agency reps. Talk to Alta. These are resources that can help you. And again, this costs no money. So tip number two, what can you do on a limited budget? Work with free policies. Meet with your people. Have the discussions. Document it. Put it in your best practice manual. And you know, while we're talking about best practice manuals, they don't really need to cost money either. These are things that if you look at the resources that are available on the Alta website, these are things that you or someone that you delegate in your operation can really start working on. And if you have a computer and you have Word and you have a printer, you don't have to pay any money to do this. It's, it's, a, it's a very cost-effective way of getting started. And then really from there, a lot of it is just common sense. You know, if you're using the professional version of Windows, you're going to have BitLocker encryption. It's in the control panel. Just take a look. Start, control panel, BitLocker. Everyone should be encrypting their hard drives. And if you have a professional version of Microsoft Windows, that's free. It's already in there. You don't need to pay for third-party hard drive encryption if you already have it. So kind of tip number three is use what you already have. If you have computers that have BitLocker in there and you can encrypt the hard drive, it doesn't cost you anything, go ahead and do it, then go right back to that Alta Best Practice Manual, document it, because it doesn't happen unless it's, it's documented. You can be doing everything, but if you can't prove it, it's not worth much. I think those are three things that you can do right away, starting at the end of this webinar, that cost nothing, that really do go a long way uh, for a smaller agent to embrace Best Practice Pillar 3 on a budget. Thanks, Greg. This is Jeremy. And uh, Lori had, had a question on, you know, what are some vendors for uh, small companies? Uh, you could go on Alta's website. You can check out their, the, the elite providers. That's at alta.org uh, forward slash best practices. Or also, you could maybe reach out to uh, any of the any of the panelists today. They could probably help you out. Um, right, Greg? Jeremy, one other thing I want to. Um touch on that um, with, with reaching out to a company. Um, a, a company to come in for best practices, um, typically before you even bring someone in, you would want to do as much as you can of your plan beforehand because all that company is going to do in a lot of cases is either say, okay, you're compliant, you get that stamp of approval, or then they'll tell you all of the other things that you'll need to do to get compliant. So in order to keep the time and the cost down of bringing someone in, um, I really recommend looking at as many things as possible, doing your plan. Um, one of the things that are very helpful on the Alta website is the checklist for each pillar of the, the type of criteria that you'll have to do for, say, complaint management or um, data security. All of those things, you have basically some very simple questions that you can go through and answer before you actually bring in a vendor. Because once you do that, that's when you're spending um, the money. All right. Uh, good advice, Jim. And there's also a uh, self-assessment report that's available to members. And also just released uh, during the Business Strategies Conference a uh, compliance management report. Um, it's about 30, I think it's 32 pages. And a title company can go through and pretty much document where they are as far as complying to each pillar. And to, the cover page lets you import your a uh, company's logo, put your company's name on the cover page. Then at the end, there's a, a page that uh, if you need to you do, reach out for a third-party certification, there's a page for them to in, input information as well. So as you guys have said, yeah, there's a, a wealth of information on Alta's website to get you started. Um, I think you also, this is Philly, I think you also have to be uh, cautious and cost-effective too because uh, I think the self-assessment is essential. Um, I think that there are, you know, some very good services out there, but you don't want to be surprised if you find out that the particular lender that feeds you most of your business, for example, prefers or requires a different uh, type of certification from a different vendor. So um, it's just a word of caution that, you know, before you spend a lot of money, you kind of want to... Um, you, as Jim was saying, you, you kind of want to do the self-assessment first, 
and then perhaps look at your customer base and, and see what their requirements uh, might be or who they might be uh, suggesting be used. Right, exactly. Reach out to your lenders, have conversations with them, find out what they what they require. Um, some interesting co uh, co questions coming in uh, from the consumer angle and really tied to kind of a, a for more than a year, Alta has been doing a uh, consumer messaging project. Uh, we held some focus groups, um, did a survey of uh, recent home first time, uh, recent home buyers. And um, Phil, you you'd mentioned kind of this this key concept, and it's reaching out to, to to educate earlier in the process. And we really found some interesting data on you know consumers' perception of title insurance. And if you reached out sooner in the transaction they had uh, more positive thoughts on what, on why they should get title insurance. They wanted the information earlier, and they want the information to come from the title agent, title company. So any thoughts that you guys might have on, on kind of where this dynamic is going and if the title industry really needs to make a, a stronger consumer-centric push as opposed to relying more on the traditional channels of the realtor and lenders? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree. I think the industry as a whole for the longest time in title insurance has been sort of this, this niche, and uh, uh, unfortunately, the, you know, the average consumer's concept of what insurance is is usually based upon either, you know, casualty hazard, uh, auto insurance, something like that as opposed to, uh, a, in essence, a contract of indemnity, which is, which is really more in line with, with title insurance. So when they hear insurance, they're probably thinking, you know, annual payments, they're probably thinking deductibles, they're probably thinking all kinds of things um, that is completely understandable because that's their familiarity with, with the term insurance. So, um, you know, you could, you could sit down with somebody and go, through the you know the uh, the old 55 title defects and and uh, uh, you know and uh, you know um, have a conversation along those lines, but you don't typically have an awful lot of opportunity, which is why the title industry I know uh, through um, you know more on the local basis, uh, uh, not just the national basis, is reaching out to the community. Uh, with seminars that are open, uh, the seminars are not uh, all limited to to the agent groups. Um, they're partnering with other organizations. Uh, again, like in the in the uh, in the uh, 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 attorney agent jurisdictions, uh, the bar associations have a broad reach. Uh, the realtor associations have a broad reach, and um, there's a, there is a, at least uh, an effort in that regard. Uh, you know, to get the education to the consumer early, because let's face it, nobody wants to make a a decision that is uh, that requires a lot of information involvement um, at the last minute at a closing, or when you're looking at uh, figures and, and and trying to decide what is uh, optional and what isn't. So um, I think that's something that the that the title industry is focusing on, and as I said early on. ALTA is just a great partner in that regard. This is Jim. Uh, just to add on to a little bit to what Phil was saying, um, part of the issue for title agents is they don't always um, touch the consumer until maybe that time of closing or when everything's finalized, so you may not have that same ability to educate, and you have to do that through the bar associations, through the lenders, through the other folks. Um, one way to kind of leverage technology to help this issue is if you are setting up any sort of integration or solution with your fees to a lender, make sure that the owner's policy is always on there. That's when you can have that conversation up front with the lender and basically say, we will be putting this owner's policy on at all points. Um, this is what the lend we would like the loan officers to say if it comes up, um, and then just go from there. Those are kind of the ways that you can really marry both technology and marketing um, to make that, make that easier for, for your companies. And this, Any is, this is Craig. Okay. When you're thinking about marketing toward consumers, 
the bar associations, the realtor associations are great places to look, but over the past few years that you've been in business, you continue to maintain and nurture a book of business. And that book of business tends to, of course, for, for all of us, uh, stay on the lender and the realtor side. Uh, utilize that book of business and, and use it to your advantage. It doesn't hurt to provide marketing materials to your existing partners that you already work with that are branded for your title agency that talk about title education. Um, again, it's important to educate early on, but even more importantly than educating early on is, is remembering the need to simplify the process for consumers. Um, I like to go back to the Apple versus Microsoft uh, branding strategies because it's so beautiful and it's applicable to almost any industry uh, on the face of the planet. That being said, Microsoft loves to overcomplicate things. They love to talk about gigabytes and bandwidth and RAM and video cards, all things that for most of us on this webinar other than Greg are probably going right over your head. However, Apple loves to talk about the actual end product. They like to talk about and answer the question, what's in it for me? When you're creating consumer-centric marketing materials, always remember to answer the question, what's in it for me in layman terms in a simple layout. Again, we work in an industry that's, that's very complex from, what, from our perspective uh, with a lot of legal work, a lot of documentation, and it's important not to let that trans transfer into your initial points of contact to consumers. Simplify your message, make it beautiful, easy to understand, and educate the consumers as they continue their adventure through the home buying process. Make sure that it's, it itself is a process. Thanks, Chris. And any suggestions on, um, you know, if a title company wants to reach out to the consumer early in the process, but, you know, they're worried about irritating their realtor clients because they kind of own that space. You know, any suggestions on how they could maybe reach out to their realtors or, 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 or lend, you know, under some, some instances to say, hey, you know, we need to be more involved in this process of educating consumers. Any suggestions and maybe what, they, what a title company could do? Most importantly is, is becoming that thought leader and really being passionate about what you're talking about. Realtors want to provide resources to their customers that are going to make them seem like a good fit, like a resourceful fit. Again, 90% of sales are based on likability and then the actual ability to perform is secondary. Partnering with your realtors to provide them the resources on the title element of the sale is only going to increase the tool set that your realtor or perhaps your lender has available to them to then reach into their markets, into their prospects, and continue to give them that value add. So remember when you're approaching realtors, when you're approaching your existing partners with that pitch to, to help with the education, it's going to be important to, and, and again, as business owners, this is a little hard, but to remove the hard sell from the initial pitch and really insert as much education into that piece as possible and strictly provide a branded educational piece. Uh, remember, create a process. Start with the educational piece and move into that hard sell as time progresses. It's all about execution. Okay. And uh, kind of as a follow-up, Helen had asked if Alta has any handouts uh, that uh, members can, can incorporate into their initial contacts with clients, and the answer is yes. Um, go to alta.org forward slash ekit. There's um, a lot of information there. There's uh, uh, sample blog posts that you could put, put on your website. Um, you could take the content. Um, use it on your Facebook, Twitter, social, you know, various social media out, uh, outlets. Um, there's also a draft letter to, the, let, letter to the editor, a letter to the homeowner that is kind of the initial touch to say, it kind of says, thank you uh, for selecting my company, you know, for your, for your title and clothing services. And then it, it offers up, you know, 
contact information if you have any questions during the transaction. So I urge you to check that out. We're actually in the process of, of revamping all that inf information. So hopefully over the, over the summer, we're going to be rolling out a, a new quote unquote e-kit. And we're also redesigning the homeclosing101.org uh, consumer facing website um, with, with a focus on the new TRID regulations. Um, so members will also be able to link to that as well as another uh, way to educate consumers. Um, Greg, I've got a couple more questions we can maybe squeeze in, and, and this is probably directed to you, and this is an encrypted, encrypted email question. Um, Lee says he's, they're having issues with spoofing, um, senders posing, posing as a lender and sending a secure email link, um, which leads to um, a zipped virus. And he's wondering, you know, are, are you seeing this and maybe are there you know, other options to try and avoid this from happening? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. You know, Alta actually wrote a piece. I think it was in last month's Title News. There was a little information block in an article that talked about how some lenders are not accepting the encrypted emails being sent to them by title companies because they do contain links. So really, we can talk briefly. Um, you know, there's the sender's perspective on this, and there's the receiver's perspective on this. You know, first thing I would say is, you know, as a title company, your employees, yourself, you know, you really, really need to be careful on what it is that you click on, because um, the person posing the question is absolutely right. A, a new attack vector is for the bad guy to email the title company as someone that they're probably going to know, maybe even working with, and pose as an encrypted email. They fool the person into clicking the link, downloading an attachment, then it's all over with. You know, If you're lucky, you only get some adware. If you're not lucky, you get banking, malware, and everything else, and all kinds of nasty things that you don't want. So from the receiver's side, the key is always education. Um, I always recommend, if you're in doubt, if you have any doubt whatsoever, call someone. I mean, think about it for a second. If you're home, if, if, if someone that you care about, a family member, a wife, a spouse, a child is at home, and someone's knocking at the front door, and you don't know who it is, are you going to advise your family just to open the door anyway? Absolutely not. So, you know, this is, this is your company. So you've got to be very, very careful what you're clicking on because it's a very real problem. So I would say the first thing is always take that message. Don't do anything with it. Don't open it. Call your IT provider. Call someone that's knowledgeable and say, hey, I don't know what this is. Because as an IT service provider, we can usually go in on the back end and we can say, hey, you know, nothing to worry about there. Go right ahead. Or, oh, whoa, wait a minute. That was a real close call. It was, it was good that you called us. So if you get something you're not sure, call someone. Ask someone. If you don't have anyone to call, don't open it. You know, if it says that it's coming from Bank of America uh, and you, you has a file number or anything else on it, you know, try just placing a telephone call. Call that person. Say, hey, I have some real suspicious stuff coming here. I don't feel comfortable. Maybe you need to fax me those documents or just confirm that you just sent something. So from the receiver side, just be cautious and, and, and treat that email coming into your inbox as someone knocking at your front door and your family's home alone. And, and you know, are you going to want them opening that door or are you going to want them to know 100% first that that is an acceptable person or an acceptable message? From the sender's point of view, um, this is a message that, that, that we really truly believe in at CloudStar is you got to adopt an email encryption solution that's not going to cause this type of problem for your customers, especially the lenders. You're going to get nowhere fast if you adopt an email encryption solution that your lenders aren't going to use, right? I mean, what's the point of that? So the good news is, is there are providers out there that do offer email encryption that makes that problem go away. It, it can be more money. It can be a little bit more involved. But the takeaway from this is, all email encryption solutions are not equal. Just like motor vehicles, you can buy a 1972 Dodge or a 2015 Rolls Royce. They're not equal. You're going to want to make sure that when you're choosing an email encryption provider that you ask these types of questions. What process is the person I'm emailing to going to have to do? Are they going to need a username and a password? Are they going to get a link? Are they going to have to download and install something? Or is it going to be just simple, just like it is today? So. 
it's all about asking the right questions, choosing the right provider, and then training your people to um, really look at that message and, and not just click on things blindly. All right. Th thank you, Greg. Uh, we are at the top, top of the hour. Uh, any other concluding thoughts uh, from any of the speakers? If, if not, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up today's call. Um, just a reminder, uh, all the speakers' contact information is on the screen. Uh, please feel free to reach out to them uh, if you have any further questions. Uh, and just to recap, I had, had a lot of questions on some of the w web links for, for Alta's website on where to get some of this information. Uh, anything regarding the, the CFPB, go to alta.org forward slash CFPB. Um, one of the questions was, was, was there sample um, closing disclosures and loan estimates? Yes, the uh, CFPB has provided those. Those are on Alta's website and a lot of other information. Um, information about uh, title insurance and to educate consumers and your business partners, that's on Alta's eKit. That is at alta.org forward slash eKit. And then also uh, the tools to um, self-assess uh, for best practices. That's at alta.org forward slash best practices. Um, as a reminder, if you missed uh, parts of today's webinar, if you think others in your office uh, would benefit from listening, a recording of the, of the presentation will be available for replay uh, next week um, at uh, alta.org forward slash title topics. I'm sure everyone's getting tired of hearing all these addresses. Um, looking ahead, our next webinar uh, will again focus on CFPB's uh, disclosures. Um, in April, we'll talk about the, the need for electronic collaboration and uh, the various solutions uh, that are out there to effectively share the data for the uh, loan estimate and closing disclosure. So keep an eye out for, for that registration information. In addition to uh, our, our monthly webinars, Alta has uh, produced a training DVD that um, addresses the economic factors that led to the passage of Dodd-Frank, uh, the establishment and goals of the CFPB, key components of the CFPB rule, and uh, how you can help your customers prepare for implementation. It also includes a section-by-section -section review of the forms, and there's also lunch and learn content that uh, you can uh, customize to uh, lead discussions with your customers. And that's also on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash CFPB. Um, so with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, thank you again to the speakers for sharing their, their perspective on uh, marketing and compliance under the uh, CFPB. I hope all the listeners found the presentation useful. Take care, everyone.